Model Y uh, approximately March next year, and then go into production um, about two, maybe around two years from now. Maybe a little less than two years, but basically um, first half of 2020 for production of Model Y. Uh, something similar for Semi and, and Roadster. Um, so these, these products are shaping up. I think they were, Semi and Roadster are actually going to be even better than what was unveiled. Um, we, we've figured out ways to, to improve the, uh, the range um, and overall functionality of the Semi uh, in particular. The Roadster, we, what I unveiled with the Roadster was the base model performance. Um, that's... Um, it's it's going to have a SpaceX option package. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, and uh, I think that it's important for us to show with the Roadster that an electric vehicle can outperform uh, an, a, a gasoline car in, in every way. So that because gasoline cars still have sort of a halo effect, um, and I think if we can show an electric car can outperform gasoline car in every way, then um, we, we sort of get rid of that halo effect of gasoline cars, um, and um, and I think that's quite a powerful thing perceptually for the for the general public. So these are just some questions that we got on Twitter. Um, I guess some, we get some really insightful questions on, on Twitter, um, as, as well as some strange ones. Um, but uh, yeah, so one of the first questions is, uh, in, in, for Model 3 production line, uh, we were, as, as I said before, we're really going to focus on manufacturing technology for Tesla. And uh, we've made a lot of mistakes with Model 3 production, that, but we've we recognize those mistakes, and we're confident we know how to address them. In fact, we are addressing them. Um, and, uh, and, and long term, I think the, the biggest competitive strength of Tesla is going to be manufacturing. This is, this is sort of counterintuitive, uh, but it is, it, is, it is going to be quite dramatic, I think. Um, the, the, the approach to automation that we've taken I think in some some cases has worked, in some cases is not, um, but it's it's clear that that there are, there are some elements of production which are really well suited to uh, people doing it, and some parts of production that are really well suited to um, robotics. And you know, one of the biggest mistakes we made was trying to automate things that are super easy for a person to do, but super hard for a robot to do. Um, and and when you see it, it looks super dumb. You're like, wow. Why do we do that? Um, so, and then as you, so it sort of makes sense to have start off with an initial production line, which is, has a relative bias towards um, uh, towards people, and then you automate the parts of the production system that are the most painful and difficult for people to do. So, particularly ones that result in repetitive stress injuries um, or mechanically difficult. That, that's that's really a much better approach. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to do for uh, Dreadnought Factories 1 and 2. Uh, it's a much more sensible way to do things. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, let, let me actually have the Tesla, some of the Tesla executive team come up. Guys, you want to come up and hang out? Yeah. JV, do you want to talk about the battery cost stuff? Um, sure. So, you know, it's difficult for us to talk about specific cost numbers. That's always a, a, a difficult topic, but we are, we are still very confident that we have the best price and performance of anything out, out there in the world. If there's something better, I don't know about it, and we've looked as hard as we possibly can. You know, we try and talk to every single battery, you know, startup, every lab, every large manufacturer, we get quotes from them. We test cells from them. So if there's something better, you know, we're, we're all ears. We'd love to find it, but we, we haven't found it yet. Um, 
So generally, uh, yeah, we're, we're still pretty confident about the, that same direction. Yeah, I mean, we think at the cell level, probably we can uh, do better than $100 per kilowatt hour maybe later this year, uh, depending upon what on commodity prices. If commodity prices are roughly where they are today, then we'll probably do better than $100 kilowatt hour at the cell level. Um, and then uh, with further improvements to the cell chemistry and the production process um, uh, and more vertical integration on the cell side, uh, for example, integrating the uh, production of, of cathode and anode materials at the Gigafactory, um, and then um, a, an approved design of the module and pack, um, we, we think long term we can, we can uh, get below $100 a kilowatt hour at the pack level, which is really the, the key figure of merit for a, a car. Uh, but long term meaning definitely less than two years. Uh, that's Tesla long term. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, Anything? I mean, yeah, um, yeah. We, we, we think we think we've come up with some pretty cool breakthroughs on this front um, on the energy density and, and cost of the of the battery pack. And um, yeah, I think it, it's going to be pretty pretty great, as far as I can see. Yeah. So. Um, when will the Gigafactory be completely built? Uh, I think we'll keep building on the Gigafactory for at least um, four or five years. Uh, it will be by far the biggest building in the world. Um, it's, it's not that far from being the biggest building in the world um, already. And uh, based on the plans that we know, it, it, might be as, it might be twice as big as the next building in the world. Um, hence the interesting tour. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's about a third done right now. Um, and um, yeah, so it's really, really, really enormous. And, and, and I think it's going quite well. Uh, there will be more gigafactories in the future. Um, we're, we're close to announcing a combined uh, uh, vehicle and battery factory. So future gigafactories will include vehicle and battery pack and powertrain as a single integrated unit. Um, and we're close to announcing something in China uh, that, um, I don't know, Roman, do you want to talk about that? But, I mean, we don't, we don't want to make an announcement. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But maybe just talk about, uh, like, preamble or something. I don't know. <laughs> so so uh, Roman is uh, head of uh, worldwide sales for Tesla. Thanks, Elon. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect to, to talk about this. Um, so we're, we're incredibly excited uh, to, uh, to build uh, first Tesla Gigafactory outside of the U.S. Um, uh, in China, uh, is specifically, uh, it's going to be in Shanghai. Um, and uh, we have been uh, holding discussions with the government, um, uh, various governments uh, in China, Really great discussions, uh, great partners. Uh, we really look forward to to uh, to uh, working with them uh, in the years to come. Uh, this is going to be, um, you know, the uh, the next generation of uh, Tesla factory. We're super excited. The stuff that we're going to be put in there, uh, and the, the cars that we're going to be building uh, in that factory uh, is going to be incredible. Uh, so um, we we going to announce something really, uh, all the details really, really soon. So I, I won't tell more, but uh, this is enough. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, particularly as we try to make cars more and more affordable, it's going to be important to um, localize production to at least the continent level. Uh, and so uh, having a, a gigafactory and vehicle factory in, in North America uh, one in China and then one in Europe um, will be. Uh, th th that's sort of the ob those are the obvious uh, uh, th three places for uh, vehicle and battery gigafactories. Um, so probably, if things go according to plan, we'll probably be announcing details of the the China gigafactory as soon as next month, um, and then uh, Europe gigafactory maybe end of this year. Um, kind of depending on on how uh, the. Uh, we need to figure out where to put it exactly. So, um, but 
probably towards the end of this year for the uh, Europe Gig Factory. Um, and ultimately, we expect probably there's 10 or 12 worldwide. So, um, there's some uh, questions on, on, on the Tesla Semi. Um, we, we are going to do another revision of the Tesla Semi design because uh, we've learned a lot and we think we can actually make it even better than what was uh, unveiled. Um, and, and really have a range that is uh, way beyond what people think, or most people in the industry think is possible. Um, and we want to, it's definitely going to be a semi that works in Europe and in North America and China and the rest of the world. Uh, you already kind of answered that. Uh, yeah, one major factory in the works and then another one in the works later this year. Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about sales? Yeah, we've, we've talked about this a few times, but Tesla will absolutely recycle, and we do recycle, all of our spent cells, modules, and battery packs. So, you know, the discussion about, you know, this, this waste is sort of ending up in landfills is not correct. You know, we, we, we would not do that. These are valuable materials, um, in addition to it's just the right thing to do. So, so we have current uh, partner companies on every major continent where we have, you know, uh, cars operating that we work with uh, to, to do this today. And in addition, we're developing internally uh, more you know, processes. We're doing R&D on how we can you know, improve this recycling process to get more of the active materials back. And ultimately, what we want is a closed loop right at the gigafactories that reuses the same recycled materials. You know, this isn't impossible. We, we see a pathway to do it. But uh, you know, that, that's where we're headed with this. And you know, today, the, you know, it, we're on the way to do that. It, it's definitely a, something that will be a huge benefit in the long term to cost as we're able to reprocess more materials instead of actually having to mine new materials. So in, in terms of repairability of Model 3, including insurance costs, um, we're working with, the, with insurance companies um, and on some internal activities uh, but we're really confident of getting the, 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 the cost of insurance for Model 3 to be at least 20 to 30 percent uh, lower than, say, a BMW 3 Series or equivalent mid-size sedans. So um, the, the safety is definitely better, um, and then we're, um, we're working on the, the, the repair costs. Uh, we've really made a lot of progress in that front. But the bottom line is that the... Um, the, the insurance cost, or total cost, cost of ownership of the Model 3 should be significantly better than any other mid-priced uh, premium sedan. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There will be, we will definitely offer a $35,000 version of the Model 3. Um, and uh, it's, I think probably at the end of this year, is when we should be able to make the smaller battery pack um, and, um, and then get into um, kind of volume production of 35K version in Q1 next year. Uh, so that's uh, definitely, we will definitely honor that obligation and we would do so right now if, if it was physically possible. Let's see, uh, yeah, we're gonna, um, in, in Hopefully next month, offer a free trial for people to try out Autopilot and see how well it works. Um, we're also uh, making rapid progress, rap rapid progress on Autopilot technology. And so the, there's a, a new version of Autopilot that's rolling out, I think, this week, uh, which um, I think is quite a significant improvement. And I think the, what, what, what you'll see is that the uh, reliability and capability of Autopilot uh, will increase exponentially over the next uh, six to 12 months. It's really, the, the improvements are very, very rapid. Um, the, the length of time to wait for a Model 3, if, you, if you're ordering one now, um, will vary quite a bit depending upon what part of the world you're in, you're in and what configuration. So if for the existing configuration, if you were to order now in the US, you probably would be waiting I'm guessing about three or four months. Um, if you, on the other hand, if you want the right-hand drive version, you're probably waiting for more, uh, over a year. 
uh, because we need to build the right-hand drive version and ship it to other countries and, and homologate the car for, for other countries. So the wait is anywhere from three to 15 months, approximately. Uh, but for current configuration, ordered now, uh, it's maybe about three or four months. Um, this is actually quite a complicated answer. There are many um, lines to the Model Model 3. In some places, it's there are several lines. In some places, there are there's just one line. And it kind of depends on what the, cap the capacity of that line is. Um, so for, for general assembly, which is like putting the parts together at the end, uh, we currently have two lines and are constructing a third. Um, the, the third line is, um, I think, dramatically better than lines one and two. Uh, we started construction on, on that third line about two weeks ago, um, and we're already putting the first car through that line. So it's really crazy fast. Um, and, and that's part of what gives me confidence about the uh, 5K per week for Model 3. Um, the, currently, the biggest constraint on output is General Assembly. Um, and I, I think we can probably get to 5,000 a week with the current two General Assembly lines. Uh, but with the third one, I'm highly confident that we can exceed uh, 5,000 units per week. Oh, and then Model 3 test drives. Uh, we should be able to offer Model 3 test drives starting the end of this month. Um, and I think we should have them in almost all stores in North America by the end of next month. Uh, we're rapidly expanding service centers. Uh, I think by the end of next, kind of year over year, we'll probably see a doubling of service center capacity for, um, for Tesla. And um, we're making major progress on the body shop front. Um, we're also, uh, it was quite a, quite a big deal, we're, we're creating Tesla uh, body shop repair uh, locations. Um, and we should have, by the end of this month, uh, uh, the, at least the top 10 um, metro areas in the US uh, being able to be serviced by a Tesla uh, body shop. Um, th this will be a dramatic improvement in the cost and time of body repair. Um, in fact, we think we might be able to do for a lot of them like same day body repair, uh, which is, yeah. Um, it's definitely possible. So I think, I think we, we want to aim for at least some number of body repairs to be same day. Whereas if we go to third parties, best case, it's about a week. In some cases, it's several weeks. Um, so this is, this is pretty exciting, actually. Um, and we're basically just taking our biggest service centers, adding in an annex uh, for body repair, and, um, and then pre-stocking uh, the, the parts so you don't have to wait for parts to come from the factory. Uh, not yet. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, March next year, uh, I think we'll have uh, something very exciting to show. All right, so let's take some questions from the audience. I think it's basically just line up at the mics and go for it. Hi, Ron. Um, I wanted to ask, is there, is there going to be a time, you know, perhaps in the next three years when Tesla is going to produce compact and or subcompact vehicles? Such a huge segment, and it seems like that would be necessary to fulfill the master plan part due mandate. Yeah, I think we'll do a, a compact car in less than five years. Yeah. All right. Hey, Ivan. Yeah, great progress. You mentioned uh, autopilot progress as well. Uh, so when do you expect like fully enhanced autopilot functionality, like following navigation, switching freeways within the six-month time frame? <laughs> um, I was just testing that last night at about 1 a.m. <laughs> um, I, th I think we might be able to release something in, in a couple of months that can do that. Um, we've been pursuing two paths, one really complicated path that I think isn't working that great, and then a simple path that I think will work pretty well. Um, um, I, I mean, I was able to drive last night 
uh, go from highway on-ramp to highway off-ramp um, using the simplified version of, um, of the control system. And um, I think with some, with some further effort, we, we can get that out in the next couple months. Um, yeah. Is this on? There we go. So as, as far as TestLink is concerned with the Model 3, uh, and to what degree of certainty, will there be a consumer or a fleet lease option within the next three years on the Model 3? Is that something that you guys already have in the plans, in the works, or is there room for ancillary business? Uh, we do. We will offer leasing on Model 3, but probably end of this year or early next, because it, it does have a slight impact on the capital usage of, of Tesla. Um, we, you know, in terms of fleet stuff, um, I think we, we pro yeah, I think people can certainly buy a lot of Model 3s um, and and then operate them as a fleet, like people do for. Uh, model S's and X's for taxis. Um, yeah, I think we'd certainly be happy to support that. Um, yeah. Kind of a simple follow-up to that, just kind of the understood thing. If I purchase a whole fleet and then Tesla comes in and says, all right, we're going to start leasing direct to the consumer or having a commercial option, that might not work out so well for me. But that that's why I'm asking. Is it Anything commercial happening that you have in the works in the next two years, even? Well, we don't really think, right now we're just super focused on um, ramping up manufacturing of Model 3 and um, making sure people can get their cars because they've been waiting, waiting for a couple of years. Um, and we're, we're not really thinking much about incremental, incremental demand generation uh, because um, as it is, uh, even getting to 5K cars per week, we would it would take us almost two years to uh, produce enough cars to satisfy those that have put down a thousand dollar deposit. So, yeah, we need to kind of ramp to 5K and then next year ramp to 10K a week um, and get um, the right hand drive version done um, and homologate the car for Europe and uh, Asia and. Um, you know, and then we'll think about other things once we've done all those things. Thank you. Hi, uh, Glenn Shotwell of SpaceX mentioned that Tesla automobiles might use uh, in some way the Starlink uh, satellite network. I was wondering if you might elaborate on that opportunity and when that might take place. Uh, it's possible. Um, I think it, it probably will be, the Starlink thing is more meant for um, terrestrial, like, like fixed terrestrial, um, homes and businesses and that kind of thing. Um, for mobile, it might be possible to use the Starlink system effectively if you had a repeater, ground-based repeater system. Um, but the, the Starlink uh, user terminal is about the size of a sort of small to medium-sized pizza. So. I'm not sure you'd want to put that on the roof of the, you know, of a Tesla. Um, I mean, maybe, but I think probably just using, most likely we'll continue to use just Wi-Fi and the cellular network. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hi. My name is Steven Singleton. And my question is, um, how is Tesla engaging regarding virtual power stations um, with governments and territories and countries that may have weak power infrastructures um, to provide clean energy to more of the world's citizens? Um, yeah, I think the, we'll have a lot more to say about that when we announce the generation three of the superchargers, uh, because that we'll, we'll be doing much more of an integrated uh, solar battery system with the superchargers. So to date, uh, only a few of the supercharger systems have solar and battery systems. Um, but long term, we want to have almost all of them have that. And the nice thing if you, uh, is that if you've got like a solar powered, kind of like a solar powered carport area and, and, and Tesla batteries, um, then even if the grid, you, you don't even need to be connected to the grid. 
Um, so it's sort of like even, you know, proof against like a zombie apocalypse, it should still work. As long as the zombies aren't too near the supercharger, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so it, 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 it'll be able to work anywhere, even if there's not good power infrastructure. He's also asking about like networking power walls together. Oh, okay. Um, and for like a virtual power plant, if that's kind of what you also were alluding to, you know, we, ha we do have a really cool project in Australia um, where we're actually networking together up to 50,000 individual homes with power walls. Um, so each one of those homes has its own battery. It can still serve as like a you know, backup power source if the utility totally goes out, if there's a storm. But when things are working normally, all those houses can talk together and then we can talk to the utility and treat them as sort of one big distributed power plant. So that, that's a really cool uh, project that has benefits across the whole grid for the homeowners, for a lot of people. And uh, you know, we're building that out right now, and we'll probably be expanding that same model. We have a small demo in the US, and we'll be expanding it worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. And we're also doing you know, quite a lot in Puerto Rico. Um, I, th I think we have, I think Tesla's more, pro more battery projects and, and solar projects in Puerto Rico than everyone else combined. So it's, we're making a big difference there, we're doing our best to. Um, and I think there's potential for kind of a virtual grid in Puerto Rico as well, um, rather than rebuilding a legacy, um, you know, sort of oil and gas based uh, energy generation system. Hey, Elon. Uh, I also think boring, boneheaded questions are not cool, so hopefully this is uh, a little more interesting. Um, <laughs> I've had a Model S since 2012, best purchase ever. Um, oh, thank you, know, you. You guys nailed design, nailed performance. The one thing I always get from friends and family, because uh, I do the drive down to LA a lot, uh, is the supercharging time. I know you mentioned you guys are working on Supercharger 3. I assume it's going to be a bit faster. Just curious, do you guys see room for kind of orders of magnitude improvement in charging time, or are we kind of reaching a plateau with current battery chemistry and technology? I wouldn't say that there's an order of magnitude improvement um, but I think a factor of three or four is is possible. Um, now the it, it won't be applicable to all battery chemistries. Uh, so 2012 chemistry can't take the charge rate of current chemistry. Um, but um, and we wish it could be wish it could. But but we just had to make a bunch of improvements to to increase the charge rate. The the key um, I think figure of merit is. Uh, that the ratio of drive time to charge time should be at least on the order of like uh, six to one, if not 10, eight to one or 10 to one. At the point at which um, you're driving, say, 10 times as much as you're charging, then the natural sort of human need to take a break, uh, <laughs> unless you have an enormous bladder, is um, <laughs> it, 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 starts to, to, it starts to become paramount. I mean, if you start a road trip at, say, 9 a.m., typically by around noon, you want to stop um, you know, uh, hit the restroom, grab a bite to eat, grab a coffee, and 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 then you want to get back to your car um, and have it be ready to go. So but that's where the if, like if you say that that's like maybe half an hour, that's kind of like the minimum threshold uh, for the car to be ready to go when you when you come back from a break. Um, and then if you get to the point where it's say say ten to one, where um, maybe it's only fifteen twenty minutes. Um, or, yeah, something on the order of 15 minutes, then the car is ready to go way before you're ready to go. Um, and for some of the long distance, like if you get, say, um, a Model S 100D, um, it, it could, you, you can drive nonstop from LA to San Francisco if you drive carefully. Um, that's, that's a long drive. So, um, and, and we think there's your potential, there's certainly uh, opportunity for range improvements um, down the road where We'll, you know, we'll be able to offer cars with ranges in excess of 400 miles. So, thanks. Hi, my name is Dr. Catherine Van Eckert, and I'm with People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I have a question regarding your use of leather in your gear shifter and steering wheel. Gear shifter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, no? I, I gear shifter, I don't think, has anything. Um, steering wheel maybe does, or... Do, Okay, the steering wheel still does, um, but are you, are you still using leather in some of your components? So we do in Model S X and three currently. We have the only leather is on the steering wheel rim, um, 
and people have asked and kind of off menu, we do replace that um, yeah. for people that are need a fully vegan car. Sure. So our concern is that, um, you know, we're obviously facing an environmental crisis and animal agriculture, as we all know, is one of the, the main contributors, particularly leather production. Um, we're really pleased to see that you have introduced non-leather seating options and that's a really fantastic step towards uh, your goal of s sustainability. We would really like you to take the next step and eliminate all leather components. Yeah, um, you know, I think S, X and 3, uh, we may be the first vehicles in production to kind of go non-leather, um, and at least in all of our seating and our trim, and we're actively working on replacing the steering wheel as well. We just want to make sure that the experience is as good, if not better. Sure. Yeah, just to add to that, so there are some existing premium vegan leather suppliers, um, Ultra Suede and Alcantara's, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. They're used by other luxury cars like Ferrari. So, yeah, we would really like to see Tesla um, step up as well. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely be uh, offering sort of, uh, as Fran says, technically, we don't say it on the website, but you can... Um, actually have a Tesla that has zero leather whatsoever, including on the steering wheel. Um, it, it's a little difficult because we do it in small quantities at the design studio, um, so it's, it's challenging to do it, do it at scale. Um, but um, uh, Model Y, for example, will, will, will not have any leather in it, including in the steering wheel, even if, if it does have a steering wheel. Thank you. When do you expect uh, significant battery advances to allow Tesla to pack twice as much energy into each of the batteries without increasing the size or weight? Twice as much is tricky, but we can certainly see a path to about a, to about a 30 percent improvement, maybe a forty percent improvement in. Um, energy in the same size battery pack. Um, but it, like, the, the, that's technology we are confident does work, and it just it needs to be scaled up uh, and made very reliable. But the 30 to 40 percent is definitely, definitely doable. Long term, probably double. Long term by other people's standards. Um, from a Tesla standpoint, we think probably two to three years to get to about a 30 percent improvement in volumetric energy density. and. Um, yeah, maybe six years or something, six to eight years to get to a doubling. It's, it's highly dependent on making um, lithium, uh, for that really big jump, a lithium anode is, is the key. Uh, just plate, plating out pure lithium on the anode. Right. Um, I started a company called Tesla Attractions. Tesla Attractions is basically a gamification version of visiting superchargers. And I know that you tweeted about this a while ago, saying that it was a good idea. And if you ever decide to go through with it, obviously I do not want to be in a position of competition with you. So <laughs> how could someone like me help the mission? Now maybe you should interview a Tesla. <laughs> 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 um, and we're, 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 you know, so our folks right now is getting through the, the critical stuff like, um, especially the Model 3 production ramp. Um, and then smoothing out the production process to make the, the car affordable, uh, getting the lower cost battery pack or smaller battery pack uh, into production. Um, so th those are kind of critical, fundamental things to really the survival of the company. Um, and then we can do kind of like the fun, fun frivolous things, like but they're, they add joy to the experience um, maybe later this year. Um, I think we always like doing sort of fun, silly things in the car, like you know the Easter eggs. That, that you know, there's like a lot of Easter eggs in the, in the Model S and X and, and three that um, are quite fun. If um, in fact, well, once they're discovered, um, they're put in the Easter egg box, which you can just tap the Tesla logo on the screen, and and then wait for about 30 seconds, and it opens the Easter egg box. Yeah. All right. My name is Ben Gerber. I'm hooked into Tesla in m multiple ways. Obviously, I'm a stockholder. Uh, I have a solar, uh, solar city panel on my roof. 
and also have a Model 3 reservation from March 31st of 2016 ready for uh, uh, configuring. But I would really, really, really like to have an all-wheel drive. Oh, yeah. Can you give an order of magnitude guess as to how long I'd have to wait for that? Oh, you should receive a configuration uh, email maybe in the next week or so. Perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, How about and we start, we start production on all-wheel drive. Actually, technically, we're starting on production on all-wheel drive uh, this month, um, and we expect to scale that up um, uh, in, that, in July and August, and uh, and be in uh, high volume production of all-wheel drive by yes. September for sure. So I have a I have a tour planned for September, uh, one month tour. <laughs> all right. Well, make sure you get any chance I can make it. Yes. We'll Thank make you sure you get your car. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I've, I got my first Model S in 2013 and have an X and a 3 now. I love the product. Um, I feel like I'll always be one of the first to try to try one of your new products. And I was just wondering, um, is there any chance in the future that we'll be able to text commands to our car, like heat my car to this temperature, come pick me up, you know, that type of stuff? We're going to keep enhancing the the Tesla app on the phone, um, and to be able to, uh, you know, long term, just tap the summon button, and your car will come find you wherever you are. Um, and do, it really wanted to learn what you, you see. Able to, you can you can change the temperature right now from the app, um, but uh, we want the car to learn what you most likely would do. Like basically, if if there was a if you had, if there was a great chauffeur in charge of the car, what would that person do? Anticipating your needs um, and knowing uh, what what you'd want, uh, so it's sort of um, like an intru an intuitive trusty steed that just o always knows what you what you want, um, ideally, um, and then you can easily adjust that as as needed. Um, so you want to as, be as close to like a mind meld with the car as possible. Yeah. Oh hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I have the Model S since uh, thirteen. And my question is about autopilot and the use of LiDAR. As we all know that uh, Tesla probably is the, the company alone that not using LiDAR, where all other vendors using it. So as uh, autonomous driving is close to reality, I think inevitably there will be a showdown on which approach will be more superior. Mm -hmm. So wh what do you think, when that time will be? Um, well. I think I think LiDAR will be seen as what what LiDAR tends to drive companies to do is to uh, uh, go to a local maximum in terms of autopilot capability or autonomous driving capability, um, and LiDAR ends up being like somewhat of a crutch. It's it, it's so it's helpful to get almost there, but if you if you rely on it, you will never get actually get there. Is 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 my opinion. So you have to make vision uh, work. Uh, extremely well uh, in order to achieve uh, true self-driving. Um, once you've made vision work extremely well, LiDAR is really n unnecessary. It's not really adding anything. Um, we do have uh, sophisticated uh, sonar, like ultrasonic sensors around the vehicle for near field. Um, and we do have a forward radar system, uh, which is useful for uh, detecting objects uh, even in uh, fog uh, sort of snow, rain, like low visibility conditions um, where you can't see what's going on. And, and that's also a case where LiDAR is ineffective because LiDAR is uh, an active, photo, active photon generator in the visible spectrum. Um, this doesn't make sense to me because uh, you have a, a massive amount of incoming photons in the visible spectrum normally. Um, so if you're going to do active photon generation, um, 400 to 700 nanometers is the wrong wavelength, uh, or, or on that order is wrong wrong wavelength. You really want to be aiming for uh, something that's uh, around a four millimeter wavelength, uh, because that is uh, occlusion penetrating. Uh, we're two-time Tesla Model S owners and um, also stockholders. A uh, question about JB. Um, every SEC filing has always included JB as a key man, 
and he was suddenly dropped off uh, in the Q1 filing, so a little concerned about JB. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And, and, uh, that was maybe uh, accidental, sorry. And, <laughs> I didn't even know that was the case. Uh, and is there a path? I have no idea why. We just made it more generic. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the intent was to make it more generic, the risk factor. There was no intended or unintended uh, implication <laughs> behind it. <laughs> JB, we love you. We want you. Okay, sorry, and one last one, which is um, the Tesla's uh, energy storage business is still running double-digit gross margins negative, it looks like, even though you've managed to deliver a lot more megawatt hours. Can you talk about the pathway to getting a profit out of that business, please? Um, yeah, well, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, definitely we expect um, our storage business to uh, turn significantly positive. And our goal is to have the same level of gross margin as the automotive business. And uh, as our volume scale and uh, as we have more power walls out there um, and and, um, our manufacturing efficiencies come in, we definitely expect that you'll see a big change and a positive trend in that every quarter into 2019. Yeah, we're, we're aiming for essentially about the same gross margin level as in the cars, which is sort of t- a 20 to 30 percent gross margin for um, all of the energy products. Um, it's, it's necessarily during the as you ramp up production, uh, it ends up being it's negative just as it was for Model Three um, and, and Model S and X. Uh, but uh, and probably later this year or certainly early next, we should be in the 20 to 30 percent gross margin uh, level for energy storage. Uh, hi, thanks for a shot on the conference call, by the way. And uh, my question was just surrounding, as, as a long-term investor, I, I hate to say this, but I feel like my trust in Tesla's timelines sort of eroded a little bit with the Model 3 ramp. So should I keep discounting things on Elon time, or are you guys have you learned anything about this? Um, I think I do have, like, an issue with uh, time. Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's, it's been true since I, I, my brother's here. I was like, uh, I, uh, I have a condition. I don't know. Um, my, my brother used to, um, like when we were catching the bus to school, <laughs> he would lie to me about the time. Uh, <laughs> and he always, always says, like, or some, some says, like, earlier than it actually was. And then I'd get there slightly after that. <laughs> and, and then we'd actually be able to catch the bus. Um, so, I, I, you know, this is something I'm trying to get better at. Um, um, I'm a sort of naturally optimistic person, um, which, other, which I would not have probably done cars or rockets if I was not. Um, but um, so I'm, I'm trying to recalibrate these, these estimates. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, try to recalibrate as much as possible. Um, yeah. I. I mean, I probably put some sandbag on future dates. That's probably wise. Um, but I, I, I kind of stay with say when I, I think it can occur. But then I'm t- typically optimistic about these things. Um, but maybe less, op- hopefully, less optimistic over time. So yeah, <laughs> like it pretty much always happens, but not exactly on the time frame. Hey, Elon, we have, um, we're about 15 minutes over one hour. Do you okay. want to take maybe a couple more? Yeah, maybe t- a couple more questions from each side. Okay. Sure. Hello, Mr. Musk. My name is Alex Perez. I really like your jacket today, and so it kind of got me thinking, has Tesla ever thought about going into the motorcycle business? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I actually used to ride motorcycles when I was a kid and I was just, like, dirt biking for... Know, like eight years or something, um, and then uh, did a, um, ro- had a road bike uh, until I was 17 and was almost killed by a truck. Um, so we're not going to do motorcycles. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Musk. My name is Sonia, and my mom has a Model 3, and my dad has a Model S, and I have one share. Um, so. I've noticed that whenever my mom is like kind of going a little bit too fast to like a 
like approaching a car at a stop sign, uh, the Tesla beeps pretty loudly to kind of warn, like, hey, you're going to hit that. I was wondering, like, are you guys thinking about developing a mode where, you, like, drivers could choose to turn it on, and then if a Tesla detected that it was approaching something quickly or was going to crash, it would, like, gradually slow down a little bit? So best case scenario, if the driver takes control, it doesn't really matter. Worst case scenario, and they crash, it decelerates so it's not as bad. It, it does actually have... Uh there's a automatic emergency braking, um, um, and I think what you're saying is like instead of like last minute kind of dramatic uh, slowdown, maybe slow down sooner but less dramatically, um, and that that is that is something that uh, w um, will occur with the uh, latest versions of autopilot. Uh, so it will if, if as it will decrease speed proportionate to the, the confidence level. Um, you know, we, we, we want to do that in a way that's not annoying to people, like the car isn't slowing down um, a lot. Um, but it's, so it's, it's a really delicate balance between not annoying people so that they want to turn it off, um, but also being safe. Um, for, for autopilot, I think it's, it, the improvements are going to be really quite Quite dramatic in the over the next several months. Um, yeah, um, it, the, the system is is intended to um, change speed proportionate to its confidence uh, in, in going forward. Um, but in order to do so, we had to improve the sophistication of the auto, autopilot neural net um, and the heuristics that go with it. So it, it just didn't annoy the hell out of people. Because um, there are many times where the car thinks it should slow down, but actually not, not really. Um, and, um, and that would just drive people crazy. So uh, I, I, I do think what you're getting at is something that you'll see uh, play out with the versions of Autopilot that are get deploying later this year, and including the one that's coming out this week. Thanks. Hi, uh, guys. I just wanted to personally thank Elon, JB, Franz, Deepak, good to have you back. Um, Tim, Emily, Vinny, Andrew, uh, the people at Tesla who I don't know by name, uh, the proud owner of an early 2012 Model S, very different than the Model 3 that my dad recently got. Um, his first new car, he's pretty perplexed and amazed by it. Um, I actually drove that from New Jersey to Richmond, probably could have skipped supercharging entirely charged the car for, I think it was maybe about 20 minutes and continued the trip. And uh, the car was actually telling me that I was ready to go before um, I was done eating the sandwich that I picked up. Cool. I just wanted to uh, ask a quick question. Is there a possibility to get a business card for the guy to your left? Because I wanted to tell him about uh, a company um, this man's been working on, disruptive technology that you're already indirectly using and wanted an opportunity to speak with you about it further. Thanks. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, we'll certainly take the business card um, and always looking to investigate interesting opportunities to improve the car. Um, if you, uh, you know, one thing I think we haven't been good at uh, educating people on is that the Model S um, and X, uh, but especially the Model S, has improved very dramatically from 2012. So we're arguably on version three or four of the Model S right now. So it's really a gigantic improvement in Model S today versus Model S of 2012 when you first started production. I really encourage anyone who's got an early Model S to test drive uh, the current version. I think you'll be blown away by how, uh, how much it's improved. Um, all right, I think that might be the last question. All right. I will uh, soon be uh, driving around in Model 3. I'm curious to, you mentioned earlier that uh, during production, uh, it's people first and automation later slowly. What uh, kind of considerations uh, prompted to do otherwise uh, when you started the Model 3 production? Can you talk about that? I think we're just overconfident about the degree of automation that was possible. Um, and um, we, we did rely quite a bit on um, tier one uh, automa manufacturing automation integrators. Um, and a couple of those things really didn't work out at, at all. Um, and now we are, we're really going to internalize all tier one uh, manufacturing uh, systems at Tesla. 
Um, so we'll, we'll have a lot of suppliers, but they'll be at the tier two and tier three level. All right, thanks very much for coming.